It's really a pleasure to be here and in such wonderful company. I think um, uh, many of us are taking more notice of birds in our yards and gardens uh, during this time. I've loved birds since I was a child and went bird watching with my father in Washington, DC. I loved finding birds, identifying them, you know, figuring out what the families they belong to. As a science writer, I grew curious about what makes birds tick. How do they communicate? You know, why do they sing so gloriously? And how do they learn their songs? How do they make decisions about food, nesting, raising their young? What's going on in their minds? What are they thinking? Are they thinking? In my research, I discovered that this is a truly thrilling time in bird science. You know, in the past decade or so, our view of birds, their brains and behavior has shifted dramatically. Um, we used to think of birds as simple-minded flying automatons. Uh, and as you'll see in a minute, we now know better. So what I learned working on this book was uh, a revelation. First about the surprising brains of birds and what we've learned about um, their astonishing mental abilities, but also about the nature of intelligence and what we can learn about it by exploring how other creatures think. So we're really in the midst of a shift in our understanding of the minds of other animals and birds have been a big piece of that progress. Uh, I'm gonna walk you through some of the highlights of what we've learned. Until quite recently, we assumed that a bird's behavior was driven solely by instinct and that its brain was so small and primitive, it was capable of only the simplest mental processes. This illustration shows the old classic view of the bird brain at the top um, on the left and the human brain on the right with the new more modern view below it. And the purple uh, shows areas of the brain that are dedicated to purely instinctive behavior. The green shows areas involved in complex cognition. So you can really see how the makeup of the bird brain has changed dramatically, our view of it. So has our view of bird behavior. Um, so in the past decade or so, scientists studying um, birds in the lab and in the field have come to realize that many species are far more intelligent than we ever imagined, capable of far more intelligent behavior and using cognitive skills that are in many ways closer to our primate relatives than to their reptilian ones. So to call someone a bird brain used to be an insult but not anymore. Now we know uh, birds can think logically and reason on par with young children. They can solve complex problems they've never seen before. They can make and use their own sophisticated tools. They can count. They can understand basic principles of physics like cause and effect. And they can pass along cultural traditions, whether they're modes of song or styles of tool making. We've learned that birds are socially intelligent creatures capable of for forming complex social networks and remembering meaningful relationships and even understanding what's going on in another bird's mind. Some birds communicate in ways that resemble language. The alarm calls of chickadees, for instance, describe an object in the same way that words do. So these alarm calls specify both the type of predator, whether it's arriving from the land or from the air, and also the magnitude of threat that that predator represents. So the number of those little DDDs at the end of a chickadee's call, those indicate the size of a predator and hence the degree of threat it represents. Now, other birds have astonishing memories like the Clark's Nutcracker of Western North America. Now, this is a bird that really puts to shame our own ability to remember where we put things. The Clark's Nutcracker can bury 30,000 pine seeds in thousands of locations over dozens of square miles and remember where it put its individual stashes 
months later, even though the landscape may have changed dramatically from snow or shifting rock and soil, these birds go directly to their location of their individual stashes. Now imagine remembering thousands of such locations. Birds do all of this with a packet of brains so tiny it would easily fit inside a knot. How is this possible? Well, we've known for some time that, bird, that, that brain size is not the only or even the sole, uh, is not the sole or even the main indicator of intelligence. What really matters in the intelligent brain is the density of neurons. And while the brains of birds may be small overall, it turns out that in many species, they're densely packed with neurons. The brains of um, parrots and corvids have twice as many neurons as similar sized primate brains and four times as many neurons as mammal brains of the same size. So now I'd like to give you three examples of birds that have enlightened us about different kinds of intelligence in the bird world. The new Caledonian crow is um, arguably the world's smartest bird, and it has shown us that birds have the capacity to make and use their own complex tools, rivaling the big primate toolmakers like chimps and orangutans. Now this crow lives on the small remote island of New Caledonia in the Southwest Pacific, and nowhere else on the planet. It's the only species other than humans to make and use hook tools, which is what this bird is doing. Now, these are sticks with a little hook on the end that the bird uses to grab insect larvae in holes in trees and plants. And the cool thing is that new Caledonian crows have different styles of tool making in different parts of the island, which are passed down from adults to young. So transmitting tool design over generations, that is a very good definition of culture. This bird, the charming and cunning African gray parrot named Alex, worked with a Harvard scientist, Irene Pepperberg, to show the world that some birds appear to have intellectual abilities rivaling those of our close primate relatives. Now, Alex could grasp the meaning of hundreds of words and use them himself in a meaningful way. He could understand uh, abstract ideas like the concept of zero. He knew his colors and shapes and numbers. He could do basic math. You could, you could ask Alex, so how many red objects are there on this tray full of colored objects? And Alex could correctly answer two or four or six. And you could ask him, what is an object made of? And Alex would pick it up, feel it with his beak and tongue, and correctly answer wood. So this goes way beyond mere mimicry. But these birds have a genius for that too. So this is Throckmorton. He's an African gray parrot who appears in my book. And he belongs to um, a couple I know, Bob and Karen. Now, Throckmorton uses his talent for mimicry to tease his family mercilessly. He can imitate Bob and Karen's voices so accurately that they themselves can't tell whether they're being hailed by their bird or their spouse. And he can also mimic their cell phone rings. And one of his favorite ploys is to summon Bob from the garage by mimicking his cell phone ring. Bob drops everything, comes running into the kitchen, and Throckmorton answers the call in Bob's voice. He says, hello, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then he finishes with this kind of flat ringtone of hanging up. Well, Throckmorton enjoys this little game quite a lot, but Bob, not so much. So one family of birds has um, shown us that some birds are capable of real artistry. So male bowerbirds of Australia and New Guinea, they build bowers to woo females. And these are little archways or other structures that are made of sticks and adorned with an array of colorful or shiny objects. So I want to emphasize these are not nests. These are theaters of seduction. So they're superbly crafted and elaborately decorated to win a mating with a female. And each species of bowerbird has its preferred ornaments. Satin bowerbirds favor blue, and great bowerbirds prefer green and white things like shells, stones, and bones, which this bird may have found in a nearby cemetery. 
One bowerbird built his bower near the house of a stained glass artist, and it was filled with little shards of stained glass that the bird had arranged by color, laying out the pieces just like a mosaic. Kind of like this bower, which belongs to a Vogelkop bowerbird. So the mental skills that I've mentioned so far, artistry, problem solving, tool making, those are things that we humans tend to do fairly well. But birds also have mental capacities that go well beyond ours, including wildly impressive spatial skills. Like the ability of migrating birds to know where they're going, to navigate to their destination, even if they're thrown off course by hundreds or thousands of miles. How do birds do this with a tiny brain and no mobile phone? Well, the answer is that they possess a remark a really remarkable collection of mental tools that are the, the natural equivalent of our compasses, our GPS, and our satellite navigation. So people often ask me what we can learn by studying bird intelligence. And for one thing, we can learn something about how our own brains work. Birds are turning out to be great models for learning on, about the human brain, how and why we sleep, how we learn language, and how speech evolved in the first place. But in my view, what's most exciting about these discoveries is the possibility of learning how another creature thinks, how a bird's mind works, and what this can teach us about the nature of intelligence itself. So after reading my book, I hope people will come to see the birds around them, the, the hawks, finches, crows, wrens, sparrows, and jays, a little differently as the clever, thoughtful, and innovative creatures they are. And also to question what intelligence is and whether there might be kinds of genius in the natural world beyond our ways of knowing. I'd like to uh, thank people who contributed images to this talk. And in closing, I just wanted to share a thought about what birds have to offer us at this moment. Um, I think certainly there's entertainment and comfort uh, to be found in, in witnessing birds sort of going about their lives in a regular way. They're so resilient, persistent, and resourceful. They're finding mates and building their nests and feeding their chicks. But I also think they have something important to tell us about navigating the world, especially under difficult circumstances. And I've really been struck in my research um, by how birds play, how they adapt, how they innovate, and especially how they work together. The birds cooperate and collaborate in everything from hunting, courting, and migrating to raising and defending their young, and even across species lines. So I think we would do well to watch birds more, tune into their behaviors, both usual and unusual, and really learn from we, while we can from their um, marvelous and still often mysterious ways of being. Thank you.